Hi. I hope wherever you are, you are enjoying your summer if you're in the Northern Hemisphere or winter, I guess if you're down South. I wanted to share with you guys that today's episode is going to be a little bit different. This is going to be an episode where I'm talking to you, suggesting four different activities that you can do with your grandchildren or children even that don't require a device and they don't require an application. I know one of the challenges for grandparents is how do we connect with those grandkids and get them out of their screens. You know, they always seem to have tablets or smartphones or devices around us all the time, and that's probably just a symptom of the age we live in. However, we've got some activities that we can do with our grandkids that do not require applications or smartphones or electronics at all. Sometimes they can add to the experiences, but these four activities that I'm going to share with you on today's episode is something that you guys can do the next time you're with your grandchildren. And I've also got a little bit of a bonus for you. If you go to the coolgrandpa.us under the tab cool resources, I also have a download for you with nine other activities that do not require an application or a smartphone. So there's some ideas in there. Some of these ideas are going to be, you're going to have that V8 moment where you slap your forehead and you go, oh yeah, of course we can do that. These are fun activities and they don't require technology at all to be involved. In fact, they prompt our interaction with the grandkids and communication and build close bonds with each other. So what I want you guys to do is, again, you can go to the show notes after you listen to this episode or go to coolgrandpa.us and look for the tab Cool Resources, scroll down a little bit, and you'll find your free download for nine application-free activities that you can do with your grandchildren. Without further ado, let's dive in and talk about these four fun activities that you can do today with your grandchildren that do not require a smartphone or any kind of electronic applications. Hello and welcome to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. This is your host Greg Payne coming at you from Studio 12. This podcast is about being the best possible grandpa you can be. Focusing on what it is to be a grandpa and how we can all share that experience together for our grandchildren. Hi, today we're going to talk about four different activities that you can do with either no apps or no phones no technology, or very low technology. The reason for this is that a lot of times grandparents are struggling to try to connect with the grandchildren, especially when they get to that uh, tween years, you know, they're 10, 11, 12, and into the teen years where smartphones and apps and everybody's heads down in an iPad or some kind of a device And so what I want to try to do is just remind you guys of some activities that are fun to do that can build connections with the grandkids. The first activity is collecting. I love collecting baseball cards. I love collecting some football and hockey cards. Now, I didn't stick with it, and I don't have a vast collection of these things. But there were ways for me to go out and, you know, I would buy the tops packages and then the FLIR and then some of the other brands that came out with uh, sports cards. And I would collect those. Some of those were so I could get players that I enjoyed. I would try to build up like the 1988 Dodgers team, you know, and get the complete set for the team. So I remember that from my youth. But then I also remember, too, being able to take those when I was visiting my grandparents and, and I'd show my grandfather, you know, some of my different sports cards and, and some of my different things. And these would engage us in conversations about players that he had seen play. We would compare and contrast and we could look up box scores and we could look up batting averages and strikeouts and on base percentages and things of that nature with, in terms of baseball. But there's so many other forms of collecting There's stamps and coins, and definitely those are two things that are probably going away at some point. You know, we may even be alive to see 
people moving to really a full-blown cashless society with Google Pay and, and Smart Pay and Apple Pay and all this stuff. It may be uh, one of these things where seeing actual paper money and coins is going to become rare for those kids. So collecting the, the quarters for all 50 states might be an interesting thing for a young kid to do with their grandfather. The other part, too, is stamps. I can remember starting and, and keeping a stamp collection for a few years where, you know, I wanted to get stamps from Argentina and from Great Britain. I wanted to get stamps from Canada, all sorts of different kinds of stamps, different colors, different images on those stamps. And be able to, I had a little scrapbook that was full of them. I never had rare stamps. I never got that far into it. But again, it was something where I had an interest as a youth and did this for a couple of years. The other part too that we can do is collect toys. And this isn't just simply like, you know, buy every single version of Barbie that's out there or buy every single Hot Wheels car that's out there. But it's really engaging with the grandchildren to figure out what their interests are, what they're interested in, and working with them on a collection. You know, if they're starting to get into baseball cards or hockey cards or dolls or action figures or whatever it may be, that's something where grandparents can help foster that. You know, we can show them how to uh, display a collection. We could work with them on things like a sh little shadow box, or we can work on them on how to display a collection in their bedroom. You know, maybe it's uh, getting a binder and, and putting their cards into a case so that they can flip through the binder and they can find the cards, but we can help protect those, those cards for them. And that's not meaning that these are big investments and we're talking about trying to get Mickey Mantle rookie cards or anything of that nature. But you know what? A 10-year-old is going to want to protect uh, their, their cards and they're going to want to be able to take them to school and show them off or have their friends come over and see their collection because it's cool. It's different. It's, it's their personality. Now, one thing too with the benefit of collecting is I've already talked about the sharing of the histories between generational type collecting, meaning, you know, baseball cards that I had with Don Mattingly and, you know, Steve Garvey and some of these guys, Cal Ripken Jr. to the modern players that builds that connection. But it's also a way to really tap in and have conversations with the grandkids that go beyond just sitting there and asking them questions about how was your day? How was school? You know, you, we, I think sometimes as grandparents, we go through a little bit of asking questions, but the kids aren't sure how to really engage or how to open up sometimes to us. But if we're sharing a common experience with them, chances are we're going to learn much more and be much more engaged with them and with what's going on in their lives just by these kinds of activities. Now, the second activity with no apps or phones, map and compass. The reason I say map and compass is because as the kids get a little bit older, they may be exposed to these things if they're in scouts, but chances are the population of kids going into scouts is really dropping quite a bit. So having a basic understanding of how to read a map, how to orient a map, how to work a compass, these things are like magic to kids. We don't have to do anything super complicated as grandparents, but we can get a map of the area, computer printout, or, or go buy a physical map and then grab a compass and then just show them how to orient a map. How, how do you get that thing so it's pointed north and they have an understanding of what's around them? The other part, too, with that, that you can do with map and compass, and especially with a compass, is at a park, you can set up a little compass course very easily. And to set up a compass course, all you need to do is create a couple of points within the park, just paste those off, you know, going from a swing set to a tree, from the tree to a picnic table, picnic table back to something, 
and then work with the child to go, okay, it's going to be so many paces at this degree. And then they find a spot really easy. Then they go to the next spot. And what that helps to do is it builds up a little bit of a useful skill set for them, but then it can also become a treasure map activity. Once they have some of the basics down and they're being successful with it, one of the cool things that grandfather can do is go out and put some treasure somewhere. And the kids have to get to the treasure by following the compass and maybe following the map. And the map could just be of the park or you could make it a little bit more challenging if they're older and going through uh, like a little bit of a state forest park or a national forest park. But that's something that's really kind of an interesting thing to do. And it gets them to, to trust themselves and trust their abilities when they're successful without needing a phone or an application, right? I mean, how many times have we been hearing about hikers that totally get lost, but they could have easily found their way out if they did not rely on their phone that went dead or couldn't get a signal. And they became stranded and they were less than a mile away from a road or a mile away from some kind of a, a creek, a, a river feature, something that would have helped them get out of the situation they were in if they had had a physical map and they knew how to trust themselves by looking at that map and then being able to orient themselves and move out through uh, not using that smartphone. So again, I'm not, don't try to overdo a map and compass course but at the same time, I think if it's done right and you're a little bit creative, you teach them some basics and then you start giving them some treasure maps and you start doing some activities with them where all they have to do is find three or four little waypoints and then they're at the treasure, you know, and that could be some cookies. It could be a little note saying that, hey, we're going to the movies tonight. Congratulations, you found this. We get to go to the movies. So have fun with it. Think about this kind of activity and make sure that it's age appropriate. You're not going to want to give the same kind of map and compass course to a 17 year old as you would a 10 year old. You want these kids and you want these grandkids to succeed. You want them to have fun with this. This is something to build on and it gives them great skills that they can show off and, and be the big dog when they're at school or if they're at a scouting activity or a church activity where using map and compass comes into play. The next activity that I want to bring up that you don't need an app for or using your phone for is cooking. Now, cooking is something that a lot of people don't tend to think about grandpas doing. Now, grandpas can cook. I can cook. I can follow directions. I can make meals. And that was all taught to me by my mom and my grandmother's. So grandpas get into the kitchen with the kids. Young kids love cooking. I mean, it's a full-blown science experiment that comes out with something that you can eat. A lot of times it's cookies, but it could be other meals as well. With grandpas, what I would suggest doing is making sure, again, that this is age appropriate to the abilities of the grandchildren because you want this to be a fun activity that they can grow on, that they can continue with and that they have an interest in. So start out with something that they love to eat and then figure out that recipe. From that point, what you do is you start to show them either websites or cookbooks and let them explore something. Next time you go to visit, it's going to be an activity that you and the grandkids are going to make a meal together. So they pick out, they they go through the cookbook and they find something. And then you help them Go through, get the ingredients. And maybe it's even a trip to the store where you show them where those ingredients are at the supermarket. Because if they're not doing the shopping, I'll guarantee you they're not paying attention to where the the baking aisle is or where to go get fresh ingredients over in the produce or whatever. So even starting with the exploration of the recipe to going to get the ingredients to then coming home and reading through the recipe to, you know, how much of salt do you need? How much butter do you need? How much 
oregano do you need? Whatever, whatever the ingredients are, you can help them by following through and learning how to read and follow the instructions to cook. The other part too is once they have a little bit of background with the cooking, you can start with the experimentation, right? You can start swapping some ingredients out. You can start adding a little bit more of one thing and a little bit less of another thing and then trying it. And if it comes out and nobody likes it, you throw it away, give it to the dog, you know, whatever. There's, there's no real penalty for cooking coming out bad. I mean, worst case is you guys got to order a pizza, you know, if, if you guys were dependent on this for dinner. The other thing that's cool with cooking is that you can work with grandkids on how to create their signature dish. Now, with young kids, that may be teaching them how to properly season a hamburger. And that's their signature dish. They can cook a hamburger and they know how to add some pepper. They know how to add some salt, maybe a little bit of garlic, uh, a slice of cheese on it. And that becomes Steven's hamburger. And everybody knows that when they need hamburgers at the house, that Steven can cook up the hamburgers. Now, as the kids get a little bit older, you can help them establish more complicated signature dishes. You know, and even if that's just creating and working up spaghetti sauce from scratch, the packet of seasoning, some tomato paste, some water, maybe you're adding in a few uh, vegetables. It's they've made spaghetti and they've made their sauce. They've got a signature sauce. And again, that's something that you guys can work on together and then be able to present to the family. And then, of course, if it's good, then everybody's bragging on them. So the next time the family wants spaghetti, they want RJ's spaghetti sauce because RJ makes the best spaghetti sauce. And what a boost to RJ's ego that he knows that he's the boss in the kitchen and that he makes the best sauce in the entire family. So look at kitchen activities and cooking in particular as a way, again, to connect with the grandkids without the use of smartphones or applications or, or screens. I mean, certainly we can use these things when we're watching a YouTube video about a recipe, but try to just follow a printed out recipe. Try to stay away from those screens because you get that conversation around the kitchen, especially when you're exploring these recipes together and you're showing them how to also clean up behind themselves, right? So as part of this, be teaching them too how to clean up behind themselves so it's not just mom or somebody else that's coming in and has to clean up behind them. Now, this last part that I want to talk about is reading a book together. Now, this is different from reading to your grandchildren in the sense of this isn't the same thing as grabbing a Dr. Seuss book or grabbing a children's book, having them on your lap and you reading to them. This is going to be for more of your preteen and teenagers. And in this sense, what you might want to do is find out what their interests are. Interests. Boy, I can't talk today. Their interests are and see what books are in those interests. And maybe what you guys do is you make an agreement to read a book a month where you alternate who's picking the book. And then what you do is you have a call at some point during the month, maybe two calls to talk about the book with them, you know, and this doesn't have to be a big family thing. This could just be you and your granddaughter where she picks out a book, you guys read it. And then in one of your checking calls or visits or, or whatnot, you get to spend an hour or more talking to her about the book about what you liked from the book, what you, your takeaways were, because your perspective as a grandfather is going to be so much different than her perspective. You know, we, we look at books at different levels sometimes, and that's one of the things I love about literature in rereading some of these books and reading some of the critiques on books is being able to see the different layers. And I'll guarantee you, and this is just natural, Children and, and young adults see books and see stories at one level, and then adults have an ability because of some of the experiences we have to see it at a different level. 
So there may be things where they're just excited about the action and adventure of the book. And then we can talk about things about, you know, hero archetypes. And we can talk a little bit about some of the nuances that we may have discovered in the book. And again, alternate those books. Not every month, not every book has to be the grandchild's choice. But when it comes time for you to pick a book, pick something that's close to their interests and isn't too difficult for them to, to grasp and understand. You don't want to pick Moby Dick if you're dealing with a 10-year-old. You've got to scale things down and you've got to make things match up. But what this is going to do is it's going to, again, create a shared interest between you and the grandchild. You're going to be able to have some conversations around that that are only for you guys. Again, this isn't necessarily to exclude the family, but we're looking for activities that are between you and the grandchild. So mom and dad can read the book all you want, all they want, but this is an opportunity for you and the grandchild to connect. So there's an opportunity here for you to read a book that they're enjoying and that they have an interest in, but then also help reinforce some of the education that they have talking about those different subjects that come up in literature. So those are four different activities that do not require applications and do not require smartphones. I've also developed a list of nine other application-free activities that are on the website and available for download. So they'll be on their own set, uh, their own web page, but then I'm also going to put them in the show notes so that you can easily download those. Click on this episode and then look in the show notes for that PDF for nine different application-free activities. None of these are going to be earth shattering. Oh my gosh, I've never thought of this, never heard of this. What these lists are for is to remind you that, hey, not everything needs an application. Not everything requires a smartphone. And these are great activities that you and your grandchildren can bond over. So leave me a comment. Let me know what activity you're doing with your grandchildren. And if your grandchildren aren't quite old enough to do these activities, Let me know what activity you are intending to do with your grandchild once they're old enough. Because I know with my grandson up in the mountains of Western Virginia, I'm going to enjoy doing a map and compass work with him. And I can already picture some of the treasures that I'm going to leave in the park or around the woods that he can find and that we can share in together. Heck, one of them will probably be a coupon for two ice cream cones down at the local creamery. So until next time, what I want you guys to do is think of ways to engage your grandchildren without screens, without applications, and remember to be cool. Thank you for listening to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do me a favor and share it with a friend. That's the best way you can help us to expand our community, as well as get the news out about how valuable grandpas are in the lives of those kids. If you'd like to leave me a comment or shoot me a potential topic for this uh, podcast, please go to www.cool-grandpa.us. Look for the comments tab, fill it up, hit submit. It's as easy as that. Until next time, remember to stay cool.